Uh, their secondary was a question mark going into it, into the season, no doubt about it. And they looked awful. Welcome into Crystal Ball College Football. I'm your host, Grayson Grune. For today, we're going to talk about the Big 12 and what was a probably pretty suspect weekend, I would say, for the conference for a variety of reasons. There were, of course, uh, some teams that performed extremely well, other teams that really, really performed badly. So we're going to talk about all of it today, and we have to start with the three teams that were the biggest disappointment in the Big 12 during week one. And all three of these teams were picked inside the top six in the preseason media poll. Baylor, Texas Tech, TCU. All three of these teams lost. Um, All three of them, I would say, lost to teams that they not only shouldn't have lost to, but probably teams they were supposed to beat up on a little bit. Uh, All of them were at least two touchdown favorites. In Baylor's case, four touchdowns. TCU's case, three touchdowns. Um, And they all came up empty. So... Why did that happen? What happened to these three teams? So quickly, you look at TCU. They obviously lost to Colorado. Deion Sanders comes in, and uh, they put up a million yards. Shador Sanders looks awesome. And TCU just frankly looked lost on defense. Um, They really got shredded, especially in the secondary, which um, I'm not going to say wasn't possible because I think coming into the year, we saw what happened to them last year. They gave up a lot of points, but they overcame that and won close games, but when you look at TCU in the secondary, you kind of felt like, okay, they got some really good players. It's just a matter of, does it all come together? It simply did not, and they got picked apart. I understand it was probably a little bit of an emotional game, um, and it was missed opportunities as well on the offensive side, which I'm going to get to, but defensively, they have problems, and they have to get better. Now, I trust their scheme to get better, but at this point, um, it was a major red flag, even though maybe Colorado is uh, not just better than we thought they were, but maybe significantly better than we thought they were, especially offensively, because I still don't think Colorado is good defensively, like not even average. I think they're going to be pretty bad defensively, but offensively, pretty interesting stuff. Now, TCU on the offensive side, how are you not going to run the football? I do not understand this. Late in the game, they just simply went away from it. And I understand that there are some looks that you're going to get throughout a game that make you think, hey, you should throw the football. But Chandler Morris throughout that game did not really show signs of a quarterback that you really want to rely on to throw the football all over the place. He was okay. He wasn't great. But you look at their run game, Imani Bailey was superb. 14 carries, 164 yards. How did he only have 14 carries? I don't understand it. They were in the game throughout. They had opportunities to run the football, especially in the red zone, and they elected not to, and it cost them. So my main question for TCU, I guess, offensively, is really Chandler Morris. Uh, Obviously, he's not Max Duggan. If he was Max Duggan, they would have won that game. He's going to have to be better. He's going to have to be better, especially in the red zone, because his two red zone turnovers... Simply put, you can point to just those two and say that cost them this game. Uh, Again, I think it was more of their reluctance to really, really go all in on running the football. It cost them. I have concerns going forward, but it won't impact them next week as they play Nichols. They'll get back on track. Baylor, let's go to them. Uh, Their secondary was a question mark going into it into the season, no doubt about it, and they looked awful. They got picked apart by T.J. Finley. Uh, G.J. Kinney's got an interesting offense there at Texas State, did some great things at Incarnate Word, and they really attacked mismatches in Baylor's secondary. That's going to be something that I think teams are going to take away from that first performance, and in general, there's a lot to work on there. Um, The other part about it was they just simply did not show up. They actually looked like a team that literally thought they were just going to roll into this game and win. And because of that, they got dominated up front, which no one could have expected. And this was on the offense line and defensive line. They barely ran for 100 yards, which if you've watched Baylor since Jeff Grimes has gotten uh, become the offense coordinator, that does not feel like something that was possible against Texas State. And it absolutely was. Uh, The offense line gave up a lot of sacks. They gave up a lot of quarterback pressures. And then on the other side, the defensive line, I would say lost the battle against Texas State. They didn't even play even 
Um, and that's a concern. My question for Baylor, I think, is this. Was that performance an anomaly? As in, you're going into your first game, you did not show up, you got dominated by a team that you, I think, underestimated, and will that change throughout the year? We've seen this before. We saw Kansas State lose to Tulane last year. Tulane, I think, is a better team than Texas State, but same concept, right, where you showed up, you didn't really respect your opponent the way that you should, you didn't take advantage of the situations that you were given, you lost the football game. It's happened to a lot of teams, and they've been able to rebound. But the only way that happens is if Baylor's week one performance was fluky. That's the only way. Because if it wasn't a fluke, if that's who they are, they might not, you know, they might win one game the rest of the year. Not likely, but possible. That's how bad it was against Texas State. And now they face Utah, which is going to be a totally different animal up front, totally different animal defensively. We'll see how they respond. Blake Shapin will not be playing in that game. He'll be out probably two weeks. They said two to three weeks. Um, I do think if he's even close to healthy, I do think that there's a chance they play him for that Texas matchup in three weeks. So Sawyer Robertson will be the quarterback. We'll see how things progress. They showed some sh signs in the passing game of being improved, um, but there's a lot to work on for Baylor. We'll see what happens going forward. Next up, Texas Tech. Uh, Tech still can't run the football. And that costs them against Wyoming. They still have no signs of life in the run game. Their passing game looked good, which is to be expected. But again, it looked good, but it didn't lead to points. They didn't score enough. And we saw that last year. We saw it at times. And they were a lot of people's dark horse pick because of what they've done in the passing game. An exciting offense, an exciting time with Joey McGuire there. But now you look up and they have the same problem. They can't run the football. They run to issues with physicality. And because of that, they lost on the road to Wyoming, who, okay, they're a fine group of five team, but it's not a game they should have lost, especially after they started up 17-0. to My main concern here with Tech is the simple fact that I don't trust them in rock fights. I just don't. I trust them when they're able to do whatever they want, throwing the football, they don't face adversity. I trust them in those situations. But when they have to run the football and they have to stop the run, I don't trust them. That's what costs them against Wyoming, and it doesn't get any easier as they take on Oregon this weekend. Once again, though, that game is in Lubbock. Maybe that Tech team against Wyoming, maybe it was just kind of one of those rough patches. They didn't quite finish the way that they should. They went up 17-0 to and tried to coast. That's what you can point to. I do think they'll put up a fight against Oregon, uh, but their defense is going to have to play a lot better, and they're going to have to simply be more physical going into that game. Quickly on some other performances. BYU, they won 14 to 0. Not impressive. Oklahoma State, they won 27 to 13 over Central Arkansas. Again, not impressive. And Texas beating Rice in a game that was 16 to 3 at halftime, not impressive. I was not impressed with either any of these three teams. I feel like there's a lot of room for growth. All three will get tested in the coming weeks and we'll see if they can rise to that if they're better than their first week shows. But in general, I, I do have concerns. Um, Oklahoma State played three quarterbacks. The offense simply was not very good. The defense was good, but they were playing Central Arkansas. So it's a matter of, okay, was the team they were playing really bad or is the defense actually going to be really good throughout? I just have major concerns about the offense, which I had concerns about coming into the year because I don't trust their quarterback play. Um, they face Arizona State this week. I do think that they'll show a better performance come out with a win, and maybe we'll be thinking about them a little bit differently in a week. BYU, offensively, they were absolutely terrible. Um, Keaton Slovis, 33 pass attempts, and he only had 145 yards passing. That's just rough. Not a good day at all. I was impressed with their true freshman running back, LJ Martin. He had 145 yards on the ground. He was fun to watch. But in general, they won this game because they had three interceptions on defense, and that's how you win 14-0. to They played really well defensively, but offensively, major, major question marks. Um, Texas, again, this is just all comes back to what you thought about them coming into the year as the odds-on favorite to win the league. Some people have them in the college football playoff. I did not see a college football playoff team in week one. That's going to have to change drastically. They face Alabama this weekend, and I'm telling you right now, if they look like they did against Rice... That game will not be close. Do I expect them to play better than that? Absolutely. But if they play like that, 
They're going to get blown out by Alabama on the road. Okay, next up, uh, I do want to give a quick shout out to West Virginia this week. Many people had them as the worst team in the Big 12, and quite frankly, they were far from the worst team in the Big 12 this week. They went on the road in a night game against Penn State and really competed. They did. Halftime, it was 14-7. to You can look at the final score and make your judgments, but if you watch that game, that really was, I would say, a two-score win for Penn State, and that's a Penn State team that I think is going to be really, really good throughout the year. So shout out to West Virginia. They are not the worst team in the Big 12 right now. And I mentioned this before the season. I think they're going to be right around a five or six win team. That's basically what they've been with Neil Brown as the head coach. And I think that's going to be right around where they were, which again, that won't make you the worst team in the Big 12 going forward. I was impressed with them. They they fought. And that's kind of what I expected from them to start the year. The new teams in the conference, UCF, Cincinnati, mentioned BYU earlier, Houston. Uh, BYU wasn't impressive. The other three had really, really strong performances uh, in week one of the conf- of conference. Um, and just being in the conference in general, very impressed. Houston beating UTSA. Um, they didn't dominate UTSA. UTSA is a good program. But it was really just a solid team win. And one that it, it felt like if Houston lost the first game of the year to UTSA, it would kind of snowball into something that was going to be a very unfor- unmemorable season. But now you get this first win over a pretty good team, and I think it could set the course for at least a decent year uh, for Houston going forward. The turnovers in that game were the difference uh, for the Cougars. So we'll see if they can mo- maintain that momentum. I'm not going to say that they're you know, a top half of the Big 12 team just based off of one game. But I do think they showed some signs of a team that is actually going to fight this year and potentially be better than many people thought. Uh, John Rice Plumley at UCF, Emory Jones at Cincinnati, they were awesome. Uh, Two of the best quarterback performances in the conference this week. Uh, Very impressed. And John Rice Plumley's performance, not shocking at all. We know what he can do. Very, very good player, dynamic runner, um, just totally in control of that offense. But Emory Jones was kind of one of those guys that I felt like could have a really bad year uh, for Cincinnati. Um, And Eastern Kentucky's not good, so keep that in mind. But I will say week one for him to come out, throw five touchdown passes, it's it's a positive sign for sure, for Cincinnati, and something that I'll definitely be paying attention to going into week two. Uh, Two more teams to talk about, or four more teams to talk about. Quickly, Oklahoma, Kansas State, they dominated. Great performances. I'll talk about Oklahoma here in a minute because they're going to be my team of the week. Uh, But Kansas State, very, very good. Methodical. Will Howard, very good. They ran the football well. Um, And I think they're a team that, once again, kind of proved that, hey, you know, we won the Big 12 last year. But now we're coming back this year, and we actually think we can build on that. And that was very interesting to see. They play Troy this week, and I think that game's going to be a little bit sneaky. It's kind of like the Tulane game last year, but I think Kansas State is better equipped uh, to handle that game and win it, even though Troy should be squarely a bowl team this year. Iowa State and Kansas, they won easily in week one. Uh, Quarterback play uh, without their starters was rather interesting um, and something that we'll see. If that continues, Jason Bean has played a lot of games at Kansas. I was kind of shocked to see that he's still on the team uh, just because he played pretty well last year. Surprised he didn't transfer, but he got the week one start. Jalen Daniels was out uh, with a back injury. We'll see how quickly he'll be back in the mix. And then Iowa State got the win. No Hunter Deckers. They face Iowa this week. I think that's going to be a really tough game for them, but I was impressed with what I saw at least in week one. Finally, team of the week, Oklahoma Sooners. No doubt about it. 45 to 0 at halftime, 66 to 0 at the end of the third. In a week that was filled with a bunch of games where a lot of people picked the over, including myself, and almost every game hit the under, uh, Oklahoma went and said, uh, you know what, we're going to cover the over by ourselves. And that's exactly what they did. They dominated this game. Arkansas State is clearly terrible. I think we saw that, but Oklahoma took care of business. Dylan Gabriel was awesome. The defense pitched a shutout, which is great to see. And in general, they were very, very dominant. They face SMU this week. Tougher challenge, um, but one where the offense should be able to continue to play good football. In general, though, the Big 12 did not have a great week. When a bunch of your top teams lose to teams that they're not supposed to lose to, it does not help the conference. But in general, there's opportunities. 
There's still opportunities for this league to get back on track next week. Lots of tough, big matchups and opportunities for the league to push itself forward. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening today. We'll be back later this week. I'll have best bets um, and a couple other news and notes as well. But thanks for listening. This has been Crystal Ball College Football.